Such good words, church. I, I pray that we will really understand the power of that truth, right? That your identity in Christ has been radically changed. Amen? Our position in God's family is forever secure because of God's grace. Amen? I mean, let's not act like this is a country club, right? You guys have heard me talk about the difference between a country club and a hospital. This is a place where we're desperate. We're desperate for God and we're desperate to to be loved as we are where we are. Amen? And I, I just so appreciate that about this community and about you. And I continue to be reminded that I don't have to continue to play an imposter. I no longer have to be someone I'm not. I can be who God knows me to be. And the growth in Christ that is afforded all of us to, to mature in Christ likeness gives us such a place of acceptance. And that's, and that's really such a hopeful thing. There, there are so few communities out there that accept you as you are where you are. And the church ought to be leading the parade to be such an accepting people. Amen? And what Jacob talked about at the beginning of that song is so true, right? We're coming through those doors with lots of baggage, right? We're coming through with, with anxieties and struggles and depression. And I just want this morning to be a time for us to get our minds and our hearts just oriented in that place where God can really begin to heal us. Because none of us are in a right place. Right? None of us are in a right place. And, you know, we need this to be a, a, a context that we can just, whew, okay, the facade's off. The mask is removed. There's, there's no more charades. There's no more masquerading. Right? We are coming off a week where, once again, in the news, we have two celebrity personas that have passed away because they came to such a hopeless state in their lives that the only way out was suicide. Kate Spade took, took her life middle of the week and then Anthony Bourdain a few days ago. And this is, again, it, it sends a shockwave into the world because we sit there and go, How? didn't these people have fame? Yes. Didn't they have fortune? Yes. But there was one thing that they were missing that led them down this, this spiraling downward path. And it was the fact that they themselves couldn't accept who they were. And I'm not here to make light of depression or, or, or make light of suicide. These are serious things that people struggle with. But where was the outlet for them? Where was the community for them, for them to be loved as they were where they were? You know, Anthony Bourdain was one of those guys that I, man, I tell you what, when I had cable back in the day, uh, man, I was, I was a fan of No Reservations from the very beginning. And I would frequently tell my wife, I'd love to have a beer with that guy. Like, he just, like, he said it as it was. He just, and I, I liked this guy a lot. And then when we got rid of cable, family vacations were all about going to a hotel, you know, where they had cable. And then our favorite thing was the flip between, I wanted to watch Anthony Bourdain and R Lori wanted to watch, uh, What's the home improvement people? Yeah, whatever that is. Or, you know, 7,000 pound life or whatever, whatever's going on out there. Everyone needs, everyone needs love and acceptance, right? I identified with Anthony Bourdain, right? Here's just this kind of surly dude who went out. And you know what I liked about him is he, he connected with people. He connected with culture. He connected over food, which is one of my favorite things to do. And yet there was something despairing in his own soul. And I, I, want you, I want you to know this morning, and again, this is, this is just good to reiterate time and time again. You may feel like you're alone. You may feel like you're the only person struggling with fill in the blank. But God wants us to be a community where we come alongside one another and we bring encouragement and we bring hope because these things are available to us through Jesus Christ. And you don't have to go through life alone. You are invited to journey with us. And if there's someone here who is going to judge you for where you're at, you let me know who they are, and I'm going to kick them in the ass, all right? Sorry. I mean, that's the reality of it, right? The church is notorious for showing condemnation, and they're rarely known for showing compassion. 
And God forbid we be a community where we act like we got all our stuff together when we don't. Amen? And I don't want anyone to suffer from discouragement, depression, or what have you. We all have issues, and there's one God who wants to meet us where we are, as we are, and he wants to love us and remind us that there is hope. Because we are not a people who live life as if there is no hope. We are a people claimed by Jesus, and we ought to be the most hopeful people out there. Hope in my life doesn't mean my life is all together. My wife ruined our van last night at 1030. I've, I've got to turn, I've got to turn this into something positive, all right? My wife calls me at 1030 last night crying. Because she's leaving here, open mic night, standing room only. She is just exhausted, right? She's calling me crying because she got into an accident, not with another car, but with a cement light pole out in the parking lot out here at Sozo. And, uh, and my, my, my first go-to was just anger. Because we got this, it's new van to us, but this thing was like pristine condition. And I pride myself on finding a great family truckster, the swagger wagon, that's what we call it. And so the van is inoperable. And I'm thinking, okay, we've got a family reunion next week in Colorado. We're supposed to drive the van to. And I'm thinking through all these scenarios, and the whole way over, I'm just like, my teeth are just grinding because I'm so mad. And yet God's saying, you need to show your wife love and compassion and forgiveness. And she would tell, she was like, as soon as I got out of the car to pick her up, and she could just tell, like, I was like, I had this chip on my shoulder. As if the car was more important than my wife's condition, her feelings, her emotions. And God was just totally pounding on my heart last night. And even this morning when we met the tow truck before services out there to, to carry away the, the family truckster, you know, I'm just sitting there going, and I was more upset over the inconvenience of it all. And I'm just like, cars can be replaced, amen? It's a tangible thing that we will not drive into eternity, and I don't think God would allow us to drive the, man, the minivan into heaven anyway, so <laughs> we got nothing to worry about there. But, you know, the fact that my wife is, is fine, we'll get the car fixed, we got insurance, praise God, right? There are, there are greater things, but you need to know, you know, 10.30 last night, I'm preparing a mess, ready to go before you with a message from God, and I'm dealing with anger in my heart. There's probably still a little residual this morning, so continue to pray for me. But overall, you know what? We are all human, right? None of us are perfect, and don't act like you are, because you'll be the biggest fake, and no one will connect with you. We connect on this level, amen? We'll go out. If you, need a, if you need a meal, to share a meal with somebody because you're just feeling alone, let me know. I got some great Thai restaurants I like to go to. We'll have you over to our house, uh, get you involved with some yard work, do something like that, you know. So, <laughs> but, but we're in this together, right? And, and, and I need to let you know this, that you're not in this alone and no one has the right here to judge you or condemn you. But today is a day that has the potential to fill your life with so much hope, right? You have right here, right now. And this is a gift. And so this morning's message is aimed to that direction. We can have hope and accept our current state of affairs and our current lot in life and yet be hopeful because what God has in store for you is greater than you'd ever imagine. And that's the hope from Scripture. So Genesis 3 is where we're going to be. So turn there in your Bibles if you would. My wife's right. This is, this is catharsis for Lori this morning too, just so you know. So she, she only suffered a, a, a bump on her head from the, from the um, was it, the visor or something like that. She doesn't know. She was so high on coffee last night that uh, <laughs> she said that light pole jumped out in front of her. She didn't even see it. So uh, it's so true. So true. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us, for knowing us. Lord, uh, knowing those places in our lives and those, those dark places in our hearts that we have, we think we can hide from you. And yet, 
you're a God who knows us more than we know ourselves, and you, you're so thorough in your knowledge of us. And yet, even though you know us so deeply, and you know the good and the bad, you still love us, and you still want to accept us. And that's such an awesome thing to consider. So thank you for that grace that you've shown us, and that love you've shown us. And, and this morning, I pray that this is a time of, of great healing and encouragement for all of us. As we think about your faithfulness to us and the future you have for us. May you anchor our our hearts, may you buoy our minds in not on our feelings, but on the facts of your objective love. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Genesis 3 is where we're going to be. Now here's the remarkable thing about Genesis, because Genesis 3 specifically could be the greatest chapter in all the Bible. Because it starts off with the greatest of offenses. Adam, Eve, man, woman, clearly disobeying God. Clearly showing their rebellion to the Almighty. And doing what He did not want them to do. They chose to do it anyways. And so what you have at the beginning of Genesis 3 is the greatest tragedy, but by the time we get to the end of the chapter, you have the greatest triumph. That's why this is such an important chapter. Because what happens at the beginning and what happens at the end of Genesis 3 fully encompasses the journey of all of us as humans, but remind us of how far we have fallen But at the end, we have the hope of how far we can be lifted up by God Himself. And so Genesis 3, if you're there, read with me, starting at verse 20. It says, Now man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now lest he stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. And he drove man out, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Three important things we need to pull out of this text this morning. And there's a reason why God has given us these verses. And I'm sure some of you have read these verses before. Maybe this is a new uh, territory in the Bible for you. But this passage, this section is brimming with hope. Because once again, we realize what God has done and is doing on behalf of his people. We have a God who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Meaning he is the start, he is the sustainer, and he is the one who will finish it for us. We have a God who is for us, not against us. Amen? And so... This passage is given to us to root us in the reality that God has got a plan. So the the message of hope permeates every part of this passage before us this morning. And first we notice in, in, in verse 20, Adam's confession. And it is faith and our need met through deliverance. Now notice what is happening in verse 20. We have just come out of the judgment, the sentencing, the consequences that God has given the serpent, Eve, and Adam. Coming out of verses 14 through 19 and the sentencing because of their disobedience would leave us pretty hopeless, right? There's going to be struggle in the marriage. There's going to be struggle with children. There's going to be a struggle with your work. And it doesn't seem hopeful or optimistic. And yet 20, verse 20 says, Adam turns to his wife and gives her a new name. And her name is now Eve, which literally means life giver. Now, how do you turn from a context of death and punishment 
to now a context of a message of life. I'll tell you how you can do this. God. God has this amazing ability to move people from the realm of death to the realm of life. What we have to understand here in this verse is that Adam's confession is all about faith and a faith that not only moves mountains, but a faith that changes your address from one of being dead to now being alive. Adam has suffered the consequences of disbelieving God. Now in chapter 20, we find him believing God. And there is nothing else that is required of us to move from the realm of death to the realm of life other than belief. Write that word down, and I know it seems too good to be true, it seems too simple, but I want you to know that the Bible says that it is belief that saves you. Period. Not belief plus going to Awana. No. Not belief plus going to your local VBS. No. Not belief plus you better tithe every Sunday. No. Not belief plus you got to take communion. Not plus you got to be baptized. Not plus you got to have this translation of the Bible. Not. It is belief, period. And that's the beauty of faith in Christ. Because it's not only assenting to what you know about the love of God and specifically how that's manifested in Jesus Christ, but it's acting on that. It's trusting it. That when God says, my son will be your substitute, you believe it. When it says that Jesus takes your sin upon himself and removes that negative debt on your account and now gives you a positive a credit, meaning his righteousness, you believe it. See, faith without belief and acting on it is a dead faith. This is what James chapter 2 says. Even the demons have faith and yet shudder. See, they have an intellectual knowledge, but they don't have the experiential awareness. See, what Adam does is he says, I'm going to take God on his word, and I'm going to believe in the future he has for us, because remember what God told Eve, that she is going to give birth to a baby who will conquer the enemy, remove this thing of sin and death in the grave, and be victorious forever and ever. That's what he told Eve. Now, why is this remarkable? She has yet to have a baby. She's the mother of all the living, and yet she hasn't given a birth, birth to one little child yet. See, that's faith. Faith is saying, God said it, therefore I'm going to believe it. And he say, he, Adam's confession is, I believe that God has a future based upon his promise to us, and now I'm going to stake my life on it. So he renames his wife Eve. That literally means life giver. And I'm going to tell you, there's something significant about name changes in the Bible. I'm sure we can think of some people who have had their names changed. Abram became Abraham. Sarah's name was changed. Uh, Peter's name was changed. What was Peter's name? Simon. How about Paul of Tarsus? Used to be Saul. See, what's interesting is when God changes a person's name, it is about a change of identity. It is a change in their nature. It is a change in their character. Now, he changed my name to Mordecai. Just You guys didn't know that about me, did you? But you guys have to call me Mordecai now. No, just kidding. Don't call me Mordecai. That is a cool name, isn't it? But Mordecai Morgan. Yeah, it's got a good ring to it, doesn't it? Sounds like a country singer. I'll tour with Jacob or something. You know. <laughs> Opening for Jacob, Mordecai Morgan. Here we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that just went way. You see what I mean about keeping it real? Like, what pastor does that? That's just weird. So don't judge me, okay? Um, but what, here's what's cool is if you're in Christ this morning, I want you to know that your name has changed. And you want to know how I know that? Because your identity in Christ has changed. And you want to know what your new name is? Let's line up. That everyone has the same name. You are the one whom Jesus loves. That's your name. Loved of Jesus. Loved of Christ. Loved of God. You used to be Scott, you used to be Amy, you used to be Carolyn, you used to be Doug, you used to be whatever. But in Christ, God sees you now with a new identity. 
And now you're here as the one Jesus loves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, Adam's confession is good for us to consider. Because he's believing God and he's acting on what God has said. That's faith. Faith is not inactive. Faith is not stagnant. Faith is not sterile. Faith acts. Faith works. And he is moving into the realm of saying, we're going to trust God. So much so, he gives his wife a name change and basically says, whatever God says is truth. Can you write that down? God's word is truth. And there's no other truth you are called to live by. We live our lives having faith in things that God really hasn't promised. I mean, think about it. There's this golfer who went out the other day, a couple weeks ago, 94 years old. I hope I'm golfing at 94. But this man has golfed six decades. Never had a hole in one. Until the very last day he told his wife and said, this will be my last round today. And goes out and gets what he holds. A par three, 100 and some odd yards, hole in one, 94 years old. I played 30 years golf, never had a hole in one. But has God ever promised me a hole in one? Is there somewhere in God's word that says, Scott Mordecai, he'll have a hole in one. And yet, we live our lives banking our life on promises that were never really made to us. Has, ever, has God promised me that my children would love Jesus? No. And yet I put so much into that, right? Like, God's going to do this, and when he doesn't, I'm discouraged and I'm defeated. How about your marital state? Anyone long to be married and just really struggling in that? How about getting along with your spouse? How much getting the job of your dreams, and yet you seem to be grinding away at a job that you're just, you're not into? See, we tend to bank our lives on things that God has never promised, and we miss out on the things that he has actually promised us. You want to know what God has promised you? Eternal life in Jesus Christ. You have a future. He has promised you an eternal home in Christ. You have a home. You are given the spirit to make you more holy. Can I tell you right now that God wants to make, he wants to make you more holy than he wants to give you a good job. He wants to make you more like Jesus Christ than give you a spouse. He wants to give you himself and the peace that comes with his presence more than he wants you to have a, 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 a operating minivan right now. Think about what you're living your life banking everything on that God hasn't promised you. Because you need to move into the realm of his word, which is truth, and what God says in his word about you, those are the things you live your life according to. All else our desires, and they're not wrong. You can pray for those things, but the problem is we miss out on the promises and we're banking our life on the things that God has never promised us. Is that truth? Is that hashtag truth right now, mic drop? Is it? Folks, you've got to have the word of God. You've got to have his promises surrounding your heart, engaging your mind, saturating your life. It's like Abraham Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What? The faith that God was going to do what he promised to do. That he has a future for you and not a future for destruction, but a future of hope and life and, and, and love and joy. Look how Paul talks about Abraham's situation in Romans chapter 4, verses 19 through 21. Paul says this in this passage. He did not weaken in faith when he was considering his own body, which was good as dead because right Abraham's 100 years old. The promise was that he was going to have a child since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of his wife, Sarah's womb, she's 90. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. See, this is what ought to be emblazoned on every human soul that loves Christ. That what God promises, he will be sure to deliver on. And not living your Pollyanna life, hoping for these things that God has not even promised you. That's where we experience discouragement. 
We think that the things that we want and we're going to trust God to give us what we want are going to bring us contentment, but this is ultimate contentment. Banking our hearts and minds and lives on the very words of God. Adam believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And it is not a belief that is inactive. It is a belief that acts. What are you trusting God with today? Are you trusting him to make you more like Christ today than than he did yesterday? That's a good promise to bank your life on. Is he promising to help you walk in humility, to trust him in your struggles, those the desires, those enticements that, that well up in every single human heart? Are you trusting that his love is far superior than any of those enticements promise you? That's a good thing to bank your life on because he's promised to be greater than those things because the giver is always greater than the gift and God is always greater than the sin that so wants to entice you and entangle you right here, right now. God gives you himself, and he is faithful even when we're faithless. Amen? That he is a constant there for us every single moment. See, that's faith. That's our confession. This is what we live by. So the gospel is given in verse 15 of Genesis 3. Now the, the, the gospel's received in verse 20. This is the moment Adam and his wife and their lives and their destiny is changed because they believe in the word and promise of God. Can I get an amen on that? It's good. Because once you come to that place, you, you, you can't go anywhere else without acknowledging Jesus, without acknowledging his lordship, without acknowledging his redemption on your behalf, which brings us to our second point, Adam's covering. Look at verse 21. So God now acts on Adam's behalf and goes and finds animals, kills the animals, takes their skins, and covers Adam and Eve. Now, what are Adam and Eve wearing up to this point? Fig leaves, right? They are so guilt ridden, so shame filled, they did just grab whatever they can, right? And they're just covering themselves. Now, God steps in and provides adequate covering. You can never cover yourselves. You need God to cover you. Amen? The fact is we wear clothing. Why? Because clothing speaks to to our identity, the things we wrestle with. Remember going through high school? I know for some of you that was a long time ago, so just do your best to remember back, back then. So 30 years ago, I remember there were groups of people. There were the jocks. What did the jocks wear? They wore jerseys, they wore their Letterman jackets, right? They all hung out together. Then there was the stoners. What did they wear? Well, they wore really bad mullets and these baseball shirts that either said Def Leppard or Journey or something on them. They are like, dude, yeah, all right. Then there was the goth. You guys remember the goths? They majored in black and white attire. That was it, right? Lots of heavy makeup, and they're like, dude, life sucks. We're going to live in this moribund state of existence and just be like, yeah, Smiths and Bauhaus and Joy Division. That's my jam, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if they talk like that. I wasn't a goth, obviously. But, you know, people wear things, and you can tell a lot of, about a person by the way they wear it. Now, you're thinking, now, me, what I'm wearing today, I raided Tom Selleck's wardrobe last night or something, right? Like, or Rick Warren's, uh, you know, that pastor wears all those Hawaiian shirts. We all wear clothes because we find ourselves identifying with certain, but deep down inside, we're all wearing something to cover up something, and perhaps it's why people go out and get piercings and tattoos and, and wear things or drive things or get a job, because they're trying to cover something. They're trying to cover something. Why? Because we all have that guilt and shame inside of us, and somehow if we could put a good front on, we'll be accepted, we'll be appreciated. And I'm thankful that everyone's wearing clothes today. Good job. Thanks for coming to church clothes today. Because we realize that we don't live in a world where nakedness is accepted. Right? Nor do we want that. Amen? But here we have God doing something because whatever clothing you are trying to put upon yourself, whatever kind of covering 
you're trying to embrace in your life and portray something that you're really not because you have a lot of insecurity, God steps in and says, let me cover you. See, I mean, that's what's going on in verse 21. Look at it again. God made garments of skin. See, the difference is these are not leaves from trees or bushes that are going to come. This is something that has happened in the garden that has not happened previously. There is a living creature that is now being killed at the hands of God. There is pain, there is suffering, there is death. Nothing like this has been experienced up to this point. So you can imagine Adam and Eve sitting there going, what's going on? What's going on is something that is now communicated through the rest of Scripture that the covering God gives you doesn't come without pain and suffering and death. See, what we have to realize is that there's the clothing of the destitute. And we are all without Christ destitute. And we try to clothe ourselves in two ways. We try to clothe ourselves, number one, with good works. And there's people that live life thinking if they just be a good person, they're accepted. And can I tell you, that's not true. You can never be a good enough person in God's eyes because good in God's eyes means perfect and we all fall short of that. For the wages of sin is death and all fall short of the glory of God. My, my family, we, we like playing board games. The other day we pulled out life. I mean, when was the last time you played life, right? I think I had 12 children and I ultimately was bankrupt at the end and I lost. But imagine if I'm, I take the money from a life game and I've got some cold hard life cash right here today for you. And I've got about, I've got almost $400,000 of life money. Now, say I went to the bank, and I said, I want to start an account today. And it's a substantial amount of money, so I hope you guys are ready for this, all right? Here we go. Go ahead and start my account. I'm going to deposit $400,000. And I hand the woman, man, this money. What are they going to do? They're going to call security. Because they're going to be like, we've got a guy who's not right in his mind because he thinks that his play money his game money is going to somehow be transferred, translated, or changed into real. This does not work in our economy. Whether I'm going to the store, whether I'm paying for gas, whether I'm paying a babysitter, whether I'm depositing, this money, though in the game of life, is great, in the real world doesn't work. Good works are like that when it comes to God's economy. But I did this and I did this, Lord. And we hear from the scripture that your good works are, are as good as filthy rags. We hear the people in Matthew chapter 7 say, Lord, did we not do this in your name and do this in your name? And he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. See, if your heart motivation is not to glorify God and you're not doing it because you're compelled by the love of Christ, your good works are actually damning works. Good works will not save you. Second thing that won't save you is religious works. Because the church is filled with people who are damned even as we speak. <gasps> I know you're sitting there going, what? But aren't we in God's house? Aren't we on holy ground? Aren't we? I mean, I'm singing to the best of my ability. I've got the translation of the Bible the pastor recommended. I tithe twice this past year. I've... And somehow in the church, we think again along these lines that if I just pray enough and read enough and give enough and serve enough, that God has got to accept me. And perhaps there's no more dangerous environment for people to think they're saved when they're really deceived. It's the church. Your religious works don't matter if they don't come from a place of your aim being the glory of God and being compelled by the love of Jesus Christ. See, I want you to do things out of delight. I don't want you to do things out of duty. Oh, I have to do this or else God won't accept me. Let me remind you, He has accepted you by showing you His Son upon the cross and you accepting that. You're accepted. And there's nothing else you need to do. That's good news. 
And now if I miss a Bible reading during the day, I'm not condemned to hell. Woo! If I don't pray correctly, I'm not condemned to hell. Yeah! If I miss a wana one time when I was 12 years old, I'm not condemned to hell. Yes! Right? So we have to be careful. We always have to ask ourselves, why do we do what we do? Even as religious people. Because again, the words of Jesus are so haunting. Did we not do this in your name, Jesus? And he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. Boy, there are churches right now where there are people in the worship service. And perhaps the number of people, men and women, that are going to hell thinking they have Jesus and they don't is astronomical. Believe in Christ. His righteousness, His righteousness is the only righteousness that will save you. You come with nothing. And for my Spanish speaking friends, nada. Nothing. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Because I want your heart to love Christ and to be so humbled by what he brings to you that really you, at the end of the day, you offer nothing. Because his righteousness is all you need and not only that, it's all you have. And so, there's the, the, the clothing, the, the death of a substitute. That's why this is so important. You cannot do it yourself. You cannot dress yourself. You cannot clothe yourself. You don't have enough righteousness to do that. So what does God do? He brings in a substitute to die on your behalf. The picture in Genesis is only symbolic of the greater covering that we have in Christ. The word is this, atonement. Write down atonement Because atonement is a covering of the guilty by the innocent. It is the very thing that assuages the wrath of God. And he has a right to be wrathful because he is a just, righteous God. And we are sinful, unholy beings who, though created in his image, sin sin has marred that image. And now God takes the payment. Because he's the only one that can make the payment to change your disposition of your heart. And he clothes you in the righteousness of Christ. This is the picture from scripture. And throughout scripture, you can never stand on your own righteousness, nor do you want to. Today, I stand on the righteousness of Christ. Today, You must stand on the righteousness of Christ. Because if this is about you and your righteousness, you ought to be the most fearful and scared being in the world. Because it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of God, an awesome God. It's like what we see in Zechariah. It's been a long time since we've been in Zechariah, isn't it? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. It's like the parable Jesus said in Matthew 22 of the, the great wedding feast and the invitations went out. And Matt, Jesus says, But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness. From that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. There was a guy who got to the wedding without wearing the proper attire. How did it fare for him? Not very well. How about the prodigal son, famous parable in Luke chapter 15? Notice the prodigal came back home and the father showed him such grace and mercy and forgiveness. He says, the father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. My son who was lost has now been found. My son who walked away from me and the family squandered his wealth has returned, and now I want to clothe him in the best clothing possible. 
Amen? Jesus and his robe of righteousness is the only thing that will give you hope. And the hope from God to you never disappoints. As a matter of fact, it perpetuates you to live in this righteousness with this new clothing, just like Revelation chapter 19, verse 8 says, look what the writer says, it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. We have been given righteousness, therefore we can be righteous people, not our righteousness derived on our own, but our righteousness that comes from Jesus. How you live is truly important. But why you live, how you live, is critical. And if you claim the name of Christ, your life ought to be motivated from a place that says, I have been clothed when I didn't deserve it. I have been given righteousness when I didn't deserve it. God is awesome. I'm not. I'm going to bank on his righteousness and his love and his faithfulness for me forever. This is why now we have been given new clothes. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, these remarkable words, when you clothe yourself, you clothe yourself with compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. This is the clothing that you are to wear as a believer in Christ. And I know there's some of you that like checklists. You like to know, am I good with God or am I not good with God? If you claim the name of Christ and your apparel looks like this, let me just tell you, you got a thumbs up. It's good, isn't it? It's what, it's what we need to hear. That God has given us His Son. And His Son is the perfect embodiment of righteousness. And we need that substitute. We need His love. It reminds me of a story. Uh, I read the other day, there's a woman giving birth in a hospital and contractions are happening and she gets the epidural. She's there with her boyfriend and their plan is to get married, but for some reason at that moment she goes, we need to get married now. She's ready to give birth. For some reason she just feels like we need, so she calls the nurse to get, can you get a minister, a reverend here fast, we need to get married. Lo and behold, someone in the next room overhears the conversation. A woman in the hospital herself who's in labor, she is an ordained minister. She is also in contractions. She says, wheel me over. Here is this woman who is ordained, who now is in the room with this woman, and they're both ready to give birth. She performs a wedding for this woman. In her travails, in her pains, in her difficulties, she oversees a wedding just before the babies are born. And I sit there and go, not only is that just a remarkable story to share, but Jesus does the same thing. He comes into this world, not one who can identify with us in our difficulties and our struggles, but one who can sympathize with us because he was human. And as he is involved in the travails of this life, even though we're the ones who are sinners and he's not, he holds our hands, he promises us something that we can never do for ourselves, he promises a love forever. And he journeys with us in our difficulties, and when we cry for help, he is there to minister that help to us. When we need a pastor, we need a minister, he is the high priest who gives us what we can never do for ourselves. And what a cool picture. That Jesus did this. Why? Because we can never do it ourselves. We have a substitute. His name is Christ. It is his righteousness that will reign forever. Which brings us to the last point. Adam's circumstances. Now notice in verse 22. Something happens and and it kind of maybe catches us off guard. So you have his confession. You have his covering But now you have his circumstances that are going to change because what does God do? He kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden. And you're sitting there going, this doesn't seem very loving or accepting. But God had to do it because the exile is an act of mercy. 
This, this is perhaps such an important point that we tend to miss, and I want to unpack it for you in just the next few minutes. See, the first thing we see is faith. The next thing we see is grace. Now we see mercy. And I know some of you were missing the blanks, and I failed to give you those blanks, so forgive me. Amen? Here's mercy. He kicks him out of the garden. Why? For two reasons. Number one, he is exiled from God's presence. And every single person needs to realize that no one can stand in the presence of God and survive. God is a holy God. He is a righteous God and can have nothing to do with unrighteousness. No one can see God and live, which was told to Moses, right, in the book of Exodus. So here now, God kicks man out of the garden. Why? Number one, because the relationship has changed and sin has entered the world. And now the dynamic between humanity and a holy divinity has changed. And it is, it is to protect man from God's presence because you cannot stand before God on your own terms. This is why man either fears God and runs from his presence or thinks they can approach God with their good works. And the psalmist says, who can ascend the hill of the Lord but only those who are holy and righteous? So here, the narrative gives us this picture of this, this presence of God now being removed. And what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to remind us that while we have the presence of God dwelling within us by the Holy Spirit, we are not necessarily in God's presence, i.e. eternity. And so therefore, we long to be back into God's presence one day. See, what the, the exile is supposed to do is not only provide us clothing and remind us of Christ's righteousness for us, but remind us that this world is not the way it's supposed to be, and one day we will be in the presence of our God forever. So there's the holiness of God, the presence of God. That's why the cherubim is stationed at the entrance with a sword. Imagine the scene, right? That man is kicked out, and now there's a cherubim guarding the sanctuary of the garden. This is a picture of God's temple, God's uh, tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. The next time we have the mention of the cherubim is the, the Ark of the Covenant, where the cherubim's wings cover the seat, the mercy seat. And it's to tell us that the cherubim is the highest evangelic order meant to protect the glory of God and his presence from unholy people. So the guard is there, an angel guarding the place that one day we will be ushered back into, but not right now. But the second thing we need to understand is that we are exiled for our protection. Because remember what's in the garden, the tree of life. What if someone didn't know Christ came and ate of the tree that would allow you to live forever? That person now eating that fruit would be eternally damned because of their eating of the fruit. And God is a God who says, I want to extend people an invitation. I want to give people a gift, and that gift is grace. And I don't want people to die in their sins, but I want people to live and reign with me forever. So he protects man from doing what man would love to do, especially after seeing the death of the animal. Who wants to die? No one. So therefore, let's eat of the fruit and live forever. But you cannot live forever in joy and hope without Christ. This is why exile is for man's protection. God wants us to live with this expectation of hope. Even though Adam and Eve were believers, even though they repented, even though they'd been forgiven, even though they'd been covered, they were still sentenced to live a life of suffering, working, marriage, family, and they did this while living with expectant hope. So in a sense, we thank God for kicking us out. Because we would be incorrigible creatures without Christ and living forever. There's grace involved. This is why the passage in Hebrews chapter 9 is so, so good for us to remember. But when Christ appeared as a great high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, but he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. What did Christ do for you? 
he secured you eternal redemption by his own blood. He is an anchor for your souls. Hebrews chapter 6. I hope you guys are writing these verses down because these are promises that I, re- I referred to earlier. They're going to build hope within you. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner of our, on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Christ is a priest for how long? Forever. And where is he right now? In heaven. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And the promise of the scriptures is this. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Where are you if you have Christ? Well, you have been raised up with him and are seated with him in the heavenly places. Are you kidding me? Your location right now, though you may feel it is entirely on earth, the spiritual part of who you are is seated with Christ in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. He's there, you're there, and yet here, my mind's blown. But this is the access that has been given to you by Christ's sacrifice You are now in the throne room of heaven. Why? Because you are seated with him in the heavenly places. And one day, the tree of life will be opened up for us again as we spend eternity with him in that heavenly place. Can I remind you of Revelation, the last two chapters of the Bible? Revelation 21, look what it says here. And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and i heard a loud voice from the throne saying behold the dwelling place of god is with man he will dwell with them and they will be his people and god himself will be with them as their god then we skip up to the next root verses it says this in revelation 21 and i saw no temple in the city for its temple is the lord no more garden No more tabernacle, no more temple, but it is Jesus, the Almighty, the Lamb. The city has no need of sun or moon or to shine in it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And then better yet, the last chapter of the Bible, first five verses, chapter 22, it says this, that the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. There it is, from the beginning of the Bible, now at the end of the Bible, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, because that's all you need. Right, my kids, my son, the other day, and you know his, his main thing right now is like, I, I don't know how to think about eternity. I don't know how to think of forever. Will heaven get boring? And I sit there and go, That's a great question. And yet we reminded that, you know, why heaven will never be boring? Because it's not about your heart playing. It's not about your cloud flying. You know what it's about? It's about the presence of Jesus and the depth of who he is will take forever to plumb. And his servants will worship him. And they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. New name. His name. And this night will be no more, and they will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. That's our future. That's our hope. That greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. That you are now no longer condemned, but you're accepted because Jesus' death for you. That is good news. Amen? I want you guys to know that so desperately. I want you guys to, to feel it. I want you to experience it. That God is to be praised. Amen? And that your good works are not going to get you anywhere. You've got to trust Christ. Last night on my way over to pick up my wife with a beat-up swagger wagon in the parking lot. Did I tell you guys about that story yet? Okay. 10.30 at night, I pass by the mosque that's down on Alma School. Parking lot is packed with cars for their evening prayers. 10.30 on a Saturday night. You're too busy watching Saturday Night Live to even think about Jesus. They're worshiping Allah. And I'm sitting there going, if the faith 
that these, even though it's misplaced faith, even the faith of those Muslims, if a little ounce of their faith and their passion for their God was in our hearts for Jesus, oh my goodness. Stoke the fires of faith in Christ in your heart. Bank your life on the promises of God. Think about the work not only has he promised to do today, but think about the hopeful future he has set up for you who love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen? Man, I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this community. If there's some way and somehow we can pray for you or journey with you, let us know. You're not alone. We're all in this together. Even an angry pastor whose minivan gets beat up by his wife can still be accepted and loved by God. And a wife who's still loved and accepted by God. Amen? All right. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you have shown us truth that is unlike any other. You have reminded us of a reality that that seems too good to be true. It is hard to accept a gift like eternal life without us feeling like we've got to do something with that. We've got to partner you with you on that, and yet we are reminded today that it is entirely the righteousness of Christ that's going to save us. And it's the, the entire righteousness of Jesus that's got to work in us to make us the people that you have designed us and created us to be. So forgive us for trying to edge our way in and thinking that we can partner in saving ourselves because we cannot do that. We need Jesus. And we are desperate for him. So I'm thankful that you're a God who loves us exactly where we're at right here, right now. All the imperfections, all the insecurities, you love us and you accept us. But the beauty of it is, God, that you have promised to not leave us in that place, but to make our experience and life better in and through Jesus Christ. May your will be done in that pursuit. May you find us to be faithful, submitting, yielding, humbled by by the love that you've shown us. And may our hearts continue to just ever be so resonant with the Spirit to say, it is all of you and none of us. Thank you, Father, for the promise of life and hope and joy and, and freedom that comes through the personal work of Jesus. May we glorify you in all we do and say. Direct our paths for your glory and your kingdom. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Meet someone you've never met before today. Love on them. Tell them how much you appreciate them. We'll see you soon. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at So's Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.